So when we're undertaking case studies, let's now look at how we collect our evidence and the forms of evidence we might collect. When we're doing case studies, we've got to collect data. Where are we going to collect the evidence that forms the case study? So according to Ian, there are six data sources. There's documentation, archival records, interview, direct observation, participant observation and physical artefacts. Documentation is a common source of evidence. Almost every case study is likely to draw on numerous documentary sources, letters, emails, memoranda, meeting minutes and agendas reports, all the admin documents, previous studies of the site or organisation, their websites, social media accounts, um, mass communication, any news. It's essential that you verify the source. Look at the spelling and addresses to avoid embarrassment and confusion. Firms are often sharing same names. Check the addresses is the simplest way to make sure you're not confusing firms. Social media can contain fake or misleading reports. Uh, Snopes.com is a, a good uh, debunking site um, also you know there are spoof firms people pretending to be firms and they're not them so be really careful also remember every document is written for a purpose documents may contradict each other it's not true a document isn't a source of absolute truth it's just somebody else's account somebody like you wrote this report and they probably had an agenda You've got to label and store your documents carefully. Both physical and digital records need a coherent filing system so you can find those documents later. I keep a spreadsheet that details location and key contents of all the documents that I collect during case. Archives, much the same as documents, though they tend to be much more formal records, service records, organisational records, maps, charts, membership lists, this sort of thing. Uh, as with documents, you need to understand the reason and method for recording the data because it might not be accurate. Personnel or phone lists are rarely up to date. I was looking at a list the other day of leading researchers and I recognised that some of those researchers actually already passed away, they died. Um, some of them were attributed to particular institutions and they I knew they'd left them many years ago. So despite the fact it was claiming to be a 2023 list of leading researchers, I, I recognise that, well, there's a lot of errors within this list. Interviews is one of my favourite ways of collecting uh, case study information. This is a guided conversation. Uh, Sometimes you've got to decide, you know, should I do an interview or a survey? It depends how restrictive you want. I like the interview because it allows you to really push beyond the first question and understand why something's happening. Usually you'll have some form of semi-structured base outline, your questions set. Uh, interviews rarely allow you to work systematically through your list of questions. Often when, when you're talking to them, they'll have answered question eight and you're still on question two. So you've really got to listen carefully and know your questions because if they jump ahead, you might choose to jump ahead. Uh, the questions need to be carefully written and presented such that you don't lead the interviewee. Um, you need to make sure they address a specific area, but the way you word the question can lead the way they speak. So you've got to test your questions carefully. Uh, often we're looking to cor corroborate facts, um, to check things out, identify alternative perspectives. We've got to be careful we don't conspire with interviewees. We don't necessarily ag agree with them. And if we wish to challenge them, you've got to do that sensitively because you are, you know, they're giving their time to you. Interviews perspectives are not facts either. Uh, it's a verbal report. It's subject to their bias and your bias. Uh, the gentrification of a neighbourhood, for example, will be viewed differently by different people. Uh, so it, it's, it's very much perspective and this is the nature of social science. A 
key skill in interviewing is being able to follow your line of inquiry whilst listening and actually following the emergent constructs that your interviewees are given to you. You need to answer your research questions. That's the thing you're there for. But interviewees may raise unexpected and important points that you need to capture. And if you're just focused on getting the answer to your question, you may miss something really insightful that the interviewees just told you and you're, you're too busy thinking about your next question. Now you're going to need consent forms for ethics. Start with these, uh, get the consent forms understood and signed because afterwards it can be awkward. Um, they might be rushing off. Uh, you may find you lose the data if they refuse at that point. Um, so it's, it's good to get that up front because if they refuse up front, then you're not wasting your time effectively doing that interview. The recording interviews uh, is a challenge. If, if you put a tape recorder on the desk, it can make somebody uncomfortable, alter what's said. Two people, one note taking, you know, if you can take a, a co-researcher with you, is often better. Uh, the second person can often sit and listen more clearly because they're writing notes down and they might spot emergent ideas and if you sort of work with them so that they, they ask questions when they spot something arising that tends to work really well. Do you do it in person or online? This is often convenience led though the dynamics online and in person are very different. Online can be easier to record um, but when you meet somebody in person they've dedicated that time to you you make a much, I, I find anyway, you, you can make a much better connection, but it's slower, it's more expensive. And yes, online, you know, Zoom Teams type interviews can be very efficient and very effective. Observation, being a passive observer. Um, that's when you basically go to a field visit to a site uh, and you just look. Uh, Visits allow direct observation, giving understanding of context. Uh, and that can be, I, I visited lots of factories. And when you're there, you, you understand an awful lot more about why things happen um, because of the way places are laid out, because of the context that you see. Obviously, site visits, even to historical events, can give insight to behaviour just because of the geography or you know the layout of, of streets, perhaps. Uh, observational protocols can be developed. Direct observation may include counting the incidents of something over a period of time, monitoring behaviour, seeing how a factory works and the machine flows. Uh, we do something called, you know, walk the process in a factory. You literally walk with the product through a factory and you understand perhaps why things move that way around. When, when you just draw it, it might not make sense, but when you walk through, you go, OK, yeah, I can see. That's why we do it this way. Photographs or mapping is very useful. If you're going to take photographs, you're going to require consent. Uh, photographs can be tricky to get, but incredibly informative. Uh, multiple observers add to reliability. So if you've got a couple of people with you, they can see things that perhaps you miss. Participant observation is where you become part of the team and yet still try and observe what's going on. You may become a resident within the neighbourhood. You, you might go and work in the factory or office, or you might become a consultant or mentor who influences decisions. It's often used in anthropological studies because observers can go and live with a social or cultural group. Um, it's also very useful when you're studying a firm to go and work there. And I, I have done that with, with very large engineering firms. I've asked for a desk and I've gone and worked there uh, and done, well, lean studies for one example with Airbus. A, a key challenge is bias. You hold a position, it gives you a stake, it makes you subject to politics. Uh, engagement makes it more difficult to observe because you're embedded uh, and you might not be in the right location when things are required. You may be too busy to see what's happening. You become too engaged to really see the bigger picture. 
physical artifacts may be physical or cultural artifacts. Examination of artifacts can lead to greater understanding and insight. Artifacts or objects may be classified according to the meaning that they can convey. Technical objects are complete, unproblematic instruments, static and unquestions. You know, they're, they're no longer changing meaning. A floor plan for a building, for instance, can be a stable reference to how something is. Now, boundary objects are stable but convey meaning. They can be interpreted differently but provide a grounds to standardise meaning. So things like field notes, maps, used in different ways by different communities for collaborative work. Epistemic objects help you construct meaning or understanding. These are dynamic and they, knowledge unf unfolds from them over time. A, a draft or a sketch or a model that maybe an architect is using that can be edited. Uh, we've done it when we're developing process maps uh, working with teams and people see the way the process flows differently and it evolves over time and then we go back to a client meeting and we can say look this is the the way that this this product is manufactured and they see you know you get great deal of insight into the process flows and why things are happening now yin proposes three principles of data collection the first is to use multiple sources of evidence. Yes, you can use one source, but it's risky because how do you know that's that's valid? Case strength really comes from triangulation. That's multiple sources which all point towards or say the same thing. So triangulation may come from different data sources, different evaluators, ev other investigators finding the same thing, theories all pointing the same way on the same data, or methods used to collect data. You aren't likely to master multiple approaches, but you should be aware enough to recognize them. And we see this when we, you know, even amongst senior academics, you have people who are, you know, particularly good at ethnographic analysis or interviewing. Um, so we have different ways of, of doing uh, data collection, but we tend to become expert in one or two but you do need to have the knowledge of the others. Creation of a case study database is so important. There is a distinction between the report you write and the data you hold. You need to maintain a database separate to your analysis. This will allow separate secondary analysis, independent testing. And if you're doing your PhD, you probably want to revisit in a few years time and, and you just won't remember. So if you've got a lovely curated data set where you've got, you know, maybe a spreadsheet guidance with notes saying what document contains what, you'll find that so much useful, uh, so much more useful in years to come. Databases need to follow the ethical guidelines. You might have to create an anonymized data set so you're stripping out the um, personal data. You can use codes to identify pseudonyms, but if you do that, you've got to keep that code book separate not on the mach same machine and ideally I, I was just have it as a hard copy, lock it in a filing cabinet somewhere, keep it very safe. Well curated data sets allow for rapid retrieval when somebody asks you for a document and that can be essential during the revise and resubmit of a paper when you say, ah, I need to revisit that particular evidence piece. And if you haven't got a good database, you'll really struggle to find it. Maintaining your chain of evidence, again, is super important because that makes the reliability of your information greater. It's the same process required in legal cases for evidence. You collect the data, you examine it, you analyse it and you report it. But what's the meta level? What do you do to protect it? You could not allow an external observer to follow the dever derivation of your evidence from research question to final conclusion show how the question leads to the method and then the data collection and then how the data collected leads to conclusion it's about that process flow chains must be clear and you've got to be able to follow them in either direction from the conclusion you've got to be able to trace it back to the data the protocol should indicate the links expected 
reports should make clear cross references between research questions, method, data and conclusions. So you can really see that flow.